Welcome back to our continuing discussion of respondent conditioning. This time we're going to talk through some different forms of respondent conditioning and respondent extinction. Okay, so here are the four forms of respondent conditioning, or I guess variations of respondent conditioning that we're going to talk about. The first is trace conditioning, in which there is a stimulus-free interval of time uh, between the offset of the neutral stimulus and the onset of the unconditioned stimulus during training. Delay conditioning is where they overlap. The neutral stimulus still proceeds or happens before the unconditioned stimulus, but they overlap. Simultaneous conditioning is where uh, both the neutral stimulus and the unconditioned stimulus occur at the same time. And backward conditioning is when the unconditioned stimulus actually precedes the neutral stimulus. Okay, just to show it again in kind of a different way, here's what our process looks like. So during um, conditioning, the neutral stimulus is associated with the unconditioned stimulus, right? They're paired close together in time. And then following the unconditioned stimulus, we have the unconditioned response. So the unconditioned stimulus is evoking an unconditioned response. And at the same time, the neutral stimulus is acquiring sort of predictive power of uh, the occurrence of the unconditioned stimulus. After sufficient training, the uh, neutral stimulus becomes sufficiently associated with the conditioned stimulus and sort of acquires that um, associative strength. The neutral stimulus becomes a conditioned stimulus, and the conditioned stimulus is sufficient to evoke a conditioned response, which again is similar to the unconditioned response. Okay, so to put it a different way and sort of in the context of the example we were talking about earlier, if our neutral stimulus is the bell and our unconditioned stimulus is this, uh, this food, this meat, the unconditioned response that the dog will produce is salivation. You can imagine in a situation in which maybe you ring a bell before you give your dog food every night, eventually the dog is going to come to associate the bell as a predictor of the occurrence of food and start to salivate in response to that bell. So our neutral stimulus and our unconditioned stimulus are becoming associated because they're being presented together in time. Meanwhile, our unconditioned stimulus is going to elicit an unconditioned response, salivation. Right Again, this is a biologically relevant stimulus. It's meat. Dogs don't have to learn anything about that. It's already sort of baked in. So they have this unconditioned response or unconditioned reflex, if you want to call it that, to salivate in response to meat. But what happens with enough pairings is that uh, the neutral stimulus of bell becomes a conditioned stimulus, uh, meaning that it now is able to evoke the conditioned response of salivation. Right? The dog has learned that when the bell rings, food is coming, so it has this response to that uh, bell of salivation. Okay, let's talk about these different varieties of conditioning. First is delay conditioning, in which the neutral stimulus and the unconditioned stimulus overlap, um, the U.S. is presented before the neutral stimulus. Uh, oftentimes in delay conditioning, the uh, neutral stimulus and the unconditioned stimulus will overlap and co-terminate, but that's necessary. Uh, the unconditioned stimulus's presence could continue on after the cessation of the neutral stimulus. Uh, for some reasons we'll talk about later on, this produces the fastest and strongest conditioning. Um, just because the temporal relationship is so tight, it makes it a very good protect, uh, predictor because the neutral stimulus and the unconditioned stimulus uh, happen very, very close together in time. Next up is trace conditioning. This is very similar to delay conditioning, except there is a stimulus-free gap between the neutral stimulus and the unconditioned stimulus. So the neutral stimulus occurs and there's a period of time where there is nothing, and then the unconditioned stimulus happens afterwards. Um, this produces slower or weaker learning than delay conditioning, just because this uh, space weakens the association, but it's still quite possible to learn. I mean, you can imagine a lot of stuff in day-to-day -day life happens in the form of trace conditioning, right? Perhaps you might hear a rattlesnake and then you know there might be 10 seconds of silence before it bites you or a toaster might buzz and then there might be a 10 second delay before it sparks and gives you a shock um, it's not always the case that the um can the uh, neutral stimulus and the unconditioned stimulus are very close together in time but the general rule is the closer they are in time the easier it is to learn the relationship Next up is simultaneous conditioning, in which the neutral stimulus and unconditioned stimulus occur at the same time. It might surprise you to learn that uh, this results in actually very weak 
conditioning. Um, this is mostly because there's not a chance for the neutral stimulus to have a lot of predictive value. The, the real value in, in classical or respondent conditioning is learning that the uh, conditioned stimulus is a predictor of the unconditioned stimulus. And something is not a very useful predictor if it just happens at the exact same time. So simultaneous conditioning uh, results in fairly weak conditioning. Uh, somewhat similarly, we have backward conditioning in which the unconditioned stimulus arrives before the neutral stimulus. Um, so the unconditioned stimulus arrives and evokes or uh, its unconditioned response, elicits its unconditioned response rather, and then following that, the neutral stimulus arrives. Um, these do become associated, but it results in very weak conditioning, again, because it's not a very good predictor. Okay, next up, let's talk about higher order conditioning, which I think is actually a really cool phenomenon. Higher order conditioning occurs when a uh, neutral stimulus is paired with an already established conditioned stimulus. Uh, then the neutral stimulus can become a conditioned stimulus in itself. Okay, so the example your book uses is um, someone's working on a piece of machinery and the piece of machinery is damaged, it makes a clicking noise and then delivers a blast of air right into the face of the operator. Um, this, you know, becomes associated, right? The previously neutral stimulus of a click has come to be a predictor of the occurrence of the blast of air. Now that clicking sound produces a blink conditioned response, right? It produces sort of a blink response in anticipation of being hit with a blast of air. Now let's say in phase two of the training we have here using the same piece of equipment, a little light blinks on immediately before a click happens, the click that predicts the blast of air. With enough pairings, uh, because you blink in response to the click showing up, uh, you will now start to blink in response to the light, right? So this conditioned stimulus of a click is now sufficiently strongly associated with the unconditioned stimulus that it can drive its own sort of higher order or second order level of conditioning, right? The click is now going to be driving uh, the conditioned response in response to the light. Okay, that might be kind of confusing just to talk about it with words, so let's look at it in a slightly different way. Let's say initially the, the machine is, makes a little clicking noise, which will represent with this bell icon right here. So uh, the machine makes a little clicking noise, and then after that happens, uh, a puff of air is discharged into the face, and um, a blink response is made in response to that. So we have an association here that uh, CS1, our bell, is a predictor of the occurrence of that air pump. All right, so now let's add another layer onto that. So we have an association here already where um, the occurrence of this sound, the clicking noise, predicts a puff of air. And now if we add another layer onto this where a blinking light uh, predicts the occurrence of the clicking noise, now when this light comes on, we're going to have a blink conditioned response. Now it's a bit of an ongoing discussion as to what exactly is being associated with what when it comes to higher order conditioning. So for example, is it that CS2 is becoming associated with CS1 and CS1 is becoming associated with the uh, air puff? Or is it that CS2 is sort of indirectly becoming associated with the unconditioned stimulus, right? Does the occurrence of CS1 sort of evoke a representation of the air puff? And thus CS2 is being, is being uh, associated directly with the air puff, or is it mediated by its association with CS1? Uh, there's a number of different theories as well. Um, really considering the nuts and bolts at that level is kind of beyond what we're doing in this course, but uh, just know that it's a very sort of nuanced and uh, complicated question. Okay, I realize this is probably kind of complicated, so let's go through it in yet another way, sort of looking at it a little bit differently. So if during phase one, as we've said already, we have our uh, machine making a clicking noise, and then immediately following that is a puff of air, then an unconditioned response in response to that puff of air. During phase one, our association is forming here, right? Where uh, this clicking noise is becoming a CS that predicts the occurrence of the unconditioned stimulus of the air. So after that learning has happened, then the uh, first CS, CS1, the clicking noise, is now able to elicit a conditioned response of a blink, right? You hear the clicking noise, you blink because you think a puff of air is probably... Okay, so now during phase two, we add another stimulus here, CS2, the blinking light, 
Uh, so this is sort of becoming associated with CS1 because they're being presented close together in time. And uh, CS1 has become so strongly associated with that unpleasant puff of air that it's able to sort of drive conditioning at this level. And of course, the presentation of the clicking noise is still uh, eliciting the conditioned response of an eye blink. So after all that's happened, when we're looking at the expression of phase two, we can see that the conditioned stimulus two, the, the light, is now able to elicit the conditioned response completely on its own in the absence of any sound. Okay, let's talk about extinction. Uh, extinction learning is, it means kind of the same thing as it does in the context of uh, operant conditioning that we talked about. Um, the main difference is in operant conditioning, it's the performing of a response and then the absence of the reinforcer, right? So that's going to fade the behavior over time because the uh, the thing with the, uh, the aspect of the learning with control over it, the outcome is absent. It's a little bit different with classical conditioning, but it's kind of the same idea. It's basically just the presentation of a conditioned stimulus alone without the unconditioned stimulus, right? So with enough pairings of the CS alone with no US, it's going to naturally fade the conditioned response. So using the same association we've talked about already, we have the pairing of the bell and the meat together. With enough pairings, our bell becomes a conditioned stimulus. Um, Right, so we have, uh, what am I, let's do this. Okay, let's keep working with the same simple example we've been using so far. Uh, we pair the bell with meat, so they become associated, and our bell becomes a conditioned stimulus and elicits the conditioned response of salivation. But what if we keep ringing the bell but not bringing any meat? What if every day, multiple times a day, we ring the bell and then present the dog with nothing? Well, this is what that would look like, right? Our, our CS is being now paired with no US, and that's going to lead to extinction, right? An extinguished conditioned response, that is to say, no salivation. And just like with operant conditioning, this is new learning, right? The animal is not forgetting that the bell used to be a protector, it's not unlearning it. What it is learning is that now, the CS, the bell, predicts no US, so no CR. And like with operant conditioning, we can see spontaneous recovery. So let's say we put the bell away entirely for a couple of weeks, and then one day we pull it out and ring it once again, we would expect to see the return right here of our conditioned response, right? The dog's gonna salivate and get excited again um, because we have spontaneous recovery of the previously extinguished CR. Okay, let's look at it with a different way and sort of a slightly different example. Let's say that um, you've had a bad run-in with a snake and you'd like to get over your fear of a snake. So you're over undergoing some extinction-based therapy. Uh, so you're asked for a couple of days uh, for your opinions on how scared you feel of a snake. And then the exposure therapy begins where you're sort of allowed to get closer to a snake in a harmless environment and, uh, you know, sort of get over your fear, right? So with subsequent exposures and no, no bad things happening, your... Um, behavior or so your sort of subjective fear of that snake drops over time, right? So in this sort of extinction therapy, you're having the CS of the snake paired with no US, right? If the US was being bitten, you're not being bitten, so no pain, no bad thing is happening to you. So over time, your fear response to the snake will diminish. But what if we wait a while and then, you know, let's say we take a couple weeks off and you go back into the room, you know, where there's a snake, you might have a higher subjective rating of fear once again. You'll experience some spontaneous recovery as, uh, you know, being exposed to the snake again for the first time in a while. Okay, that's it for this mini lecture. I will see you next time.